recording. Good evening, everyone. We'll be getting started in just a few moments. We want to let everyone join. All right, we still have some people joining, but we are going to go ahead and get started. So I just want to first say thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for tonight's virtual author event and discussion with Dean Koontz. Dean's newest book, The Forest of Lost Souls, was just released two weeks ago today. And it's a really thrilling examination of loneliness, survival, greed, corporations, lots of different things that I'm sure we'll talk about tonight. Um, before we get started, I'd like to remind you that tonight's event is just one of our many author programs scheduled, both virtually and in person, at the Hudson Library. For fans of mysteries and thrillers, we have two upcoming author events you don't want to miss. Um, we have award-winning mystery writer David Rosenfeld, another author who really likes dogs, who will be at the library on November 7th to discuss his newest novel, The More the Terrier. And we'll also host a virtual discussion with New York Times bestselling author Reese Bowen on November 19th. For a full list of our wide ranging discussions, just visit our website, hudsonlibrary.org. Now, I know we have a lot of fans in the audience tonight, so I would love your participation. Um, with a long career, I'm sure you probably have many questions about his books, both new and old. So leave whatever questions you have tonight for um, Dean in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen, and we will get through as many questions during the second portion of tonight's event as we have time for. Also, copies of his newest book, The Forest of Lost Souls, are currently available for purchase courtesy of Hudson's own independent bookshop, The Learned Owl. Um, I've added a link to the chat for easy purchase. Now, we have a bit of a long biography here, but I would like to introduce tonight's guest. When he was a senior in college, Dean Koontz won an Atlantic Monthly Fiction competition and has been writing ever since. As of today, he has published over 105 novels, a number of novellas, and collections of short stories, and collectively has sold over 450 million copies of his work. His books have been published in 38 languages, and um, 14 of his novels have risen to number one on the New York Times hardcover bestseller list. In addition to that, 16 of his books have risen to the number one position in paperback. This makes him one of only a dozen writers ever to have achieved these milestones. His books have also been major bestsellers in countries including Japan and Sweden, and a number of them have been adapted for both motion picture and series, which we'll talk about a little bit later tonight. So Dean, as we talked with before, we let everybody in, you're a little bit more selective in your time and energy with writing and how much you talk with people. So it's a real pleasure to um, speak with you this evening. Thank you for joining us. Well, let's see if I'm coherent. Uh. <laughs> I'm sure you will be. Um, so let's go ahead and get started um, with our discussion this evening by talking about your newest release, The Forest of Lost Souls. And I'm always curious when we speak with authors um, about what is the lead up for writing a particular story. So for example, is there a particular event, something you read in the news or some spark of inspiration that led you to create this story? Well, you never know where some story ideas come from and then others you do. Uh, and in this particular case, I remember I had written a series about a character named Jane Hawk. And I loved Jane Pop. She was tough. She was uh, principled. She was knowledgeable in the extreme about the world she lived in, which was the world of high tech and policing and all of that. And everyone in the world was after her and nobody could get hold of her. And that was a wonderful series of books for me because I was in love with the character. And then one day here, after I've written many other things since then, it suddenly struck me, why not write a novel about a woman who was just as competent as Jane Hawk, but not in all that stuff, not in the techie stuff, not in the police stuff, but in her understanding and love of nature and her involvement with the natural world. 
And uh, that's sort of the little kernel with which it started. And that, then suddenly the idea of dogs and wolves came into it. I, uh, I love dogs and I admire wolves. I don't have one currently. And uh, then I thought, hmm, the next little thing that piled into it is, this is really a book about somebody who is almost like an incarnation of a mythical figure because of her love of nature. And that myth of the mythical figure seemed to me the best be a Diana's, Diana, Roman goddess of the hunt and the moon. Uh, and so those things kind of all collapsed together at some point. And in my strange head, they made perfect sense as being longing together. And I sat down to write it and had great fun. It was fun to write a woman character just as tough as Jane Hawk, but in a different realm, in a different world, in the natural world. And it's woe to all those people who think they can take her out when they challenge her in her own environment. Absolutely. I can see the comparisons that you were saying with our main character in this book versus Jane Hawk. Um, I know my mom was a huge, as we talked about, it was a huge fan of yours. And the Jane Hawk series is like one of the closest to hers. Um, where do you kind of pull the inspiration then for writing like a really strong female character and a female lead? Is there like anyone in your life that inspires you? Um, anyone from like other books and literature? I'm just curious. Well, uh, my father was a nightmare. He was diagnosed as a sociopath. He was a violent alcoholic. But my mom, as much as she could be, was a strong woman. Uh, and she stood up against him. She was a sickly person often in the hospital, so she didn't have the ability to just walk away. Um, but she was strong. My wife is an extremely strong person uh, and is a model of a lot of the women in my novels. And then the, one of the people in my life that had the most profound effect was a high school English teacher named Winona Garbrick. She had been a whack in World War II. That does not mean she was crazy. It means she was in the Women's Army Corps. And uh, she was uh, a wonderful teacher and a wonderful human being. And she pushed me and inspired me in my writing. And so, and everyone in school was terrified of her, including all the six foot, two inch jocks. Uh, but she was, while a great disciplinarian, a very sweet person. And uh, so she had a profound effect on me too. I think it's been that there have been many strong women in my life. And uh, I've had these examples uh, and it's it's been a blessing. Absolutely. And on the flip side of the coin too, though, in, in addition to your ability to write a strong female lead, um, I have to congratulate you, I guess, that's the best way to say it, of writing honestly detestable characters. <laughs> characters that are truly so full of hatred, um, lack of empathy and just dark, um, particularly in your newest one, um, and I am a, I'm a huge horror fan. So the fact that I had to close the book at one point and say, I've had enough of this for a moment. I need to take a step away speaks a lot. Um, and I'm referring obviously to your newly appointed sheriff who um, tries to have his way with our main character at one point early on in the novel. And I'm just curious, how do you get into the mental mindset to write a character that is truly filled with so much evil? And is it difficult for you to do that? Well, uh... If you're awake and alert to the nature of the world, evil is a significant part of it. And then because my dad was who he was and what he was, uh, I, I grew up not understanding him at all. I, I thought it was always the alcohol alone, but it often didn't explain why he would do the things he did because he would do them when he wasn't drunk. Uh, and then uh, late in life, when I had, he was in his early, well, I guess he was about 70. Uh, we had moved to the West Coast. And one of the great things about that was we didn't have him knocking on the door at three in the morning, drunk and uh, shouting and carrying on. Uh, but one day a friend of his, his only friend, uh, called up and said, he's dying. He has a year to live. Uh, he has nothing because he was always destitute. And if you send him money, you spend it in the bar room buying drinks for everybody the same night he got the money. 
Uh, so he said, what can you do? And I, Jared and I, my wife, sat down and talked to him. He had never taken care of my mother and me. So it seemed like if we didn't take care of him, I would be just doing what he had always done. So because he had a year to live, that wasn't such a big commitment. And we moved him out to the West Coast, got him an apartment, took over all his expenses and overseeing him as if I was his father. And then, of course, he lived for 14 years. <laughs> and that teaches you to be careful about the, the good you do. Um, and he was uh, uh, in and out of psychiatric wards during that time. Uh, uh, he was a threat to different people. He threatened to kill me on two occasions and once tried to do it. Uh, and in the fact of that, he was, uh, he was in psychiatric wards where he was analyzed and given reports on him. And at first it was said he was uh, borderline schizophrenic with tendencies to violence complicated by alcoholism, which is a really bad diagnosis. But the second time they simply said he's a sociopath. And that was a great liberating thing for me because it suddenly explained everything. Uh, because sociopaths simply fake all human emotions and do not have them. Uh, and that not only was liberating, but it explained to me the answer to your questions. Why do I understand that mind so well? It's because I grew up oppressed by it. Uh, and it's always stuck with me. I thought as a kid, I would never ex ex understand it and never escape it. But it came that I did escape it, and now that I came to understand it. So in a sense, uh, my father is a significant motivator of my career. That's understandable. Um, thank you for sharing that. I will say, though, when, um, not to spoil, but when um, our newly elected sheriff does get a comeuppance, I did cheer audibly out loud. And I think that's sometimes part of it, too, when I read about, like, purely despicable characters. I do like to see it if there is a comeuppance for them. Yeah, I think the comeuppance has to be measured out to who they are and what they are. Uh, and, uh, and I don't shy away from giving them the ultimate punishment. Uh, and in this one, uh, uh, there are more than one or two of them. I've said to a couple of books I signed, Here's a tale about good wolves, good dogs, and bad men. Uh, and that's sort of exactly what it is. And one good woman, I should add. And then, uh, although there's actually two good women in this, uh, this right. story. Um, as I may have said when um, someone I work with asked what the, how the book was, I said, never, try, never um, double cross somebody who has their own backhoe. And that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's a perfect way of putting it. I might write that in a book. Never yes. cross someone who's there like that. <laughs> um, um, now, another thing I really thought was really interesting, but it's just more of my own personal interest in your book, was it was very well researched in terms of your information about gem collecting, mining, and even like the qualities to look for in gemstones, as well as like the process of cutting them um, so that they reveal like their best facets. And it was just very well researched to me. So in general, because I mean, you've written about tech companies, uh, potential viruses, um, all types of things out there. Like how much research really goes into your book and like how much of like that beginning process does that element take up? There's a, just a little bit at the beginning because I, I begin books not knowing what the story is, what the plot is. I know mm -hmm. my character, I know her situation or his situation. So the research takes place as I go. Uh, and, uh, and I've learned, I learned way early in my career, don't get something wrong because you'll get letters and they won't be pleasant. Uh, I don't like getting letters that call me an idiot and a fool. Uh, I may be an idiot and a fool, but I don't like getting letters that tell me that. So as a consequence, I, I do a lot of research. And it, it's very odd because as a kid, in uh, school, even in college, I'm sorry to tell you this, I, I hated going to the library to do research. Uh, and I wanted to read also the novels I wanted, not what I was taught that I ought to read. And as a consequence of all that, I often made up facts in papers I wrote, made up attributions to books that didn't exist. Uh, 
And I got away with that in high school and college. But then one day when I was an adult, uh, that was pretty late in my career, uh, I suddenly decided uh, that I had to research because I got a couple of those letters. And uh, I found out that I loved research. I loved learning stuff. Uh, and it was intriguing to pick up new information and then to fold it into the novel in a way that didn't, didn't interrupt the flow of the story, that actually kind of enhanced it and made it more fun and more interesting while you're waiting for the bad guy to get his head chopped off. <laughs> Not that anyone in this book gets his head chopped off. Worst things happen to him. <laughs> But uh, yeah, and I and it's still that way. I just finished a, a book set in the 30s and early 40s. And it was one of the most fun uh, things I've done because the research was almost crippling because you start thinking, oh, uh, she plucked the Kleenex from the box. Whoa, wait a minute. Were there Kleenex in 1930? And you start having to research not just all the major issues, but all the the little minute things about daily life. And uh, I even found that to be intriguing and interesting. Uh, so um, I hope I answered your question and you go on very well. No, you did. And I actually think that in this book, the discussion about like the gemstones and the mining, as well as the discussion about plants without giving away a major spoiler, um, I thought that was really fascinating, but also really helped kind of set the scene too about her and her isolation and where her focus really lies instead of where like the focus of us, you know, that's more like living in suburbia or a community that is regularly interacting with people where our priorities may be. Yeah, I, she, yeah. she is particularly in an isolated environment and uh, in nature to her is her sustenance and her, uh, and her solace and uh and so to have her mining a placer mine which is what those kind of gemstone mines are called uh that her grandfather actually did before her was uh, i also thought tied her to a generational love of nature and to the woods and to the uh this sustaining relationship between her and her grandfather right and as you mentioned, like it's her sustenance, but I would also think this is a great time to kind of talk a little bit about the symbiotic relationship and communication that you tend to exhibit, not just in this novel, but in many novels with both humans and animals. Mm -hmm. um, as you mentioned, we have the mountain lion that plays a role in symbolism in your, in your newest story, as well as the, the wolves um, and other books of yours have had other related um relationships between humans and animals. Can you tell us a little bit about the usage, your consistent usage of animals in your books and what that means to you personally? Well, I think it largely started when I became a dog lover. And uh, I had been a dog admirer most of my life, but I hadn't as an adult had a dog. And as a child, I may have a dog briefly. Uh, and once I had a dog, in our lives, once both of us did our first golden retriever, that dog fundamentally changed our lives. Uh, I stopped working at five o'clock because of that dog. I had often gone on to seven at night, 7.30 before having dinner. And uh, that dog lived with us for a week. And every day came around the edge of my desk at five o'clock and gave me the stare and I said, oh you're so cute you're so sweet and went back to work and then the next day she came over and laid her head in my lap at five o'clock and when that didn't work she just started getting more and more aggressive until it became rather hilarious i knew she was saying i know what time it is you shouldn't be working it's time for me and uh, when i finally gave in and took a few days off at five o'clock that actually ended up being the end of ever working past five o'clock. And I was fascinated that an animal could cause you to change your routine so quickly and, and so knowledgeably, in essence, about what time it was and that you were overworked. Uh, and that started me thinking about animals and how we consider them. 
and whether there might be more going on within them that, excuse me, we think. And I think that's entirely true now that I've had three wonderful goldens. Uh, there's much more intelligence in dogs than we think. Uh, and uh, that starts you thinking about other animals and their place in the world and their place in our lives. And, and it starts making you get more sympathetic to them and more protective of them. And that certainly is sort of part of what this book is about because uh, Vida, our lead, her relationship is not just uh, with the wolves in her neighborhood, but with all animals in the forest, basically. And uh, and it's not in a Disney sort of way. You know? The birds don't sing and caper around her everywhere she goes, but, uh, but she does have an interesting relationship with nature and its creatures. Absolutely. Um, I really like to how um, in the book, you have one of the wolves kind of sometimes enter her actual domain, her home, and when he does that, he kind of sheds a little bit of the wolf persona because he's a hybrid. And sometimes that little bit of the, the domesticated, like the, the canine in him comes out from the other side of him where he will allow the pets and he'll want to like sleep by her bed and kind of be that little bit of more of a protector, but also wanting some cuddling role, if that makes sense. Yeah. As long as his pack of fools don't know that he's sort of a Jack Lemmon character. He's part dog and part wolf. Uh, and uh, and leads the pack because of his intelligence, and uh, so he he wants that from her, but he kind of doesn't want the rest of the pack to know that he needs this. Although I think they figured it out because they sometimes behave a little more like dogs than wolves. He's got a reputation to keep with the pack. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know earlier, I don't know, I don't think she's walked past in your background again, but your current golden retriever was making some cameos when it was just you and yeah. I a little bit earlier. And you did talk a little bit about what makes golden retrievers um, so special to you as a breed. But what I wanted to let you know is I always love that in your biography, in the back of your books, how you always mention Trixie and Anna spills these enduring spirits. And I want to know, what does that mean to you? Like, how do these dogs not only stay with you in the present, but stay with you moving forward, too? Well, they were so important in our lives uh, and, and had such great impact in our lives uh, that uh, when they're gone, I wrote an entire book about Trixie, A Big Little Life. Uh, and I wrote, uh, I wrote a book with Anna called Ask Anna, which was a dog book of dog advice, and uh, which is a lot better than human advice generally. And uh, uh, they were just so deeply a part of our hearts that uh, they never are gonna be gone. They have a little memorial space in the backyard where there are stones with them and their pictures. And uh, and then the Elsa came into our lives. And uh, it's uh, one of the hardest things is putting down a dog. Uh, and and it kind of, I think, changes you to be there in the moment that has to be done. And uh, and so you want to say, uh, I had to do this to you, but uh, you're, you're not going to ever be let go. Absolutely. And that's such a powerful thing, I know, as a dog lover myself. Um, okay, I want to... Um, I do have one um, last question before we kind of step back and really talk about your career as a whole before we move on to audience questions. And I would love to know just as a writer, what decisions come into play if a book will be a standalone or a series? And the reason why I'm saying this is because it wasn't just my thoughts, but the thoughts of some other people that thought, okay, so a lot of people end up getting, uh, and they're no longer with us at the end of this book, but it seemed like there were still some loose ends do you ever decide after the fact, you know, I want to keep going with this book and turn this into a series? Or do you know at the time of writing, this is it, this is the story, and this is going to stay contained in this one volume? Uh, generally, I know. Uh, I, I said for many years I'd never write a series. <laughs> and then uh, suddenly I, I started the Christopher Snow series, which was to be three books. And I apologize to everybody. Uh, that I never wrote the third. But the problem was the publisher hated book number two, which I thought was just as 
much fun as book number one. But if I had delivered book number three, that would have been the end of our relationship. So I said, okay, I will uh, I'll deliver a couple other books and then go back to it. But that continued to be my publisher and it just never quite happened. And then I changed publishers. And now the first two books are stuck with the, with the publisher and I can't do the third. So it was sort of a trap. And I said, that's why I don't write series. You never know what's about to happen in the business world that you can't control. Uh, but I got to book with Odd Thomas and I knew early on in that book, it was a series. I thought it was a series of four or five novels. It turned out being eight. Uh, and I love that series. I just had the greatest time with it. And they, uh, when uh, Jane Hawk came into my mind, actually within the second chapter of the first book, I thought, whoa, this is not one novel. This is a series of novels that turned out being five. Uh, so it isn't anything I ever go into knowing it is. Uh, it's, it's basically, you know, it's the character telling me, you're not going to be done with me. Uh, there are levels to me you can't explore in. And that always, that when I hear that, when I feel it, uh, then you pursue it. But there are a lot of things there are certain books I would have loved to write sequels to, like Life Expectancy. Uh, but uh, I knew that at the end, I would be stretching it if I tried to carry these characters forward. They kind of resolve themselves in one volume. It's just an instinctive thing, uh, I think. And, and you sort of just trust your intuition. That makes sense. I will say, um, just because it's a good segue since you mentioned him, and we have two people already that have said that Odd Thomas is their favorite character that you've ever written. And I'll admit to that um, of your series, Odd Thomas was my favorite as well. And you say he's special. What makes that book and that main character so special to you? Uh, it took me a while to figure out. I, I've told the story. I was working on a novel called The Face. It was about halfway through it. And into my head came the line, my name is Odd Thomas, I lead an unusual life. I had no idea where that came from. It had nothing to do with the way I was writing. But I write nothing out longhand. I, I, my handwriting is abysmal. Uh, but I keep a yellow pad beside it to write little notes to myself, don't forget this or that. And I turned to that and I wrote the line out because I thought it was interesting. Next thing I know, I was writing a story. And I wrote the first chapter completely by hand. Uh, and I couldn't wait to finish the novel I was on, even though I was enjoying it, so I could move on to Odd Thomas. Uh, and he just took control of me. And it was, uh, uh, he became so real uh, that I, I thought, I, I don't know how many, are there 20 novels here? Or uh, is there one? And I think what it was about uh, Thomas was his humility was such a strange quality for a lead in a book with a lot of action. Uh, books with a lot of action, the guys are not fry cooks in a little restaurant, uh, and they're not Ad Thomas who doesn't want to pick up a gun, but it will beat the bad guy up with a broom. Uh, he's, and he is a gun if he has no other choice, but... Uh, he was so quirky, and I thought, uh, I don't know where this has come from. And then one day, partway through the novel, when I thought, this is a series, I also realized this is a character whose humility is central to him. And he's on his way to a journey to absolute, total humility. And the night I said that to my wife, this is going to be about a character who is getting ever more humble as he moves along and ever more accepting of the world as it is and his ability, inability to really effectively change it except in small ways. And in the end, he's going to be a completely humble person. And she said, how will you know how to write that? <laughs> and I thought, exactly right, because I am not entirely humble. I don't have absolute humility. But, uh, I, he, I let him guide me. Uh, and at one point, a cardinal 
of the church who uh, did an interview with me, and she said, I love this character. And do you know what you're writing? And I said, well, he's a fry cook. And he, and he said, no, no, I mean, do you know ultimately what he is and where he's going? And I said, well, I think he's on a journey to absolute nobility. And he said, that's right. You're writing about a saint. And that was a little daunting. I said, I don't know that I would know what a saint is like. But, uh, but uh, one thing I loved about Odd was his sense of humor. And I think my publisher at the time when I delivered that book, one of the reasons he had such a hard time with it, he didn't like it, was he didn't think you could have a lead character in that kind of story who was as funny as I was. And I said, well, I think you can. And uh, we all deal with the vicissitudes of life with humor. So why doesn't that make the character more appealing? And why doesn't that mean you're more concerned about his fate? And I think that's true. And I think that's why Odd uh, touched so many people. Right. And since that series expanded into eight books, you were writing his story for some time. So because you mostly stick with standalones and series have been a smaller um, part of your canon, was it kind of hard for you to say goodbye to him when the time came? Or were you kind oh, of yeah. ready? Uh, no, I actually could have gone on with him. But uh, not to give anything away too much for people who haven't read the first book. Uh, but a promise is made to him in the first book uh, by a card from a fortune-telling machine in a carnival. And it's a very important uh, promise because of a great loss that he has. And uh, I always felt I have to fulfill that promise. Uh, it, it would just be awful if we get to the end of this series and uh, and that promise from that fortune teller isn't kept. Uh, it was a difficult promise to keep. But at the same time, I thought, I also can't stretch him and just keep denying him that. He had become so important to me as a, almost a real person that denying him that promise seemed like, how do I go to bed and sleep with myself if I do too many books with him? Yes, they, they're very popular, they have a large audience, but, uh, but he's a real person to me and it's time uh, that he got what he's been promised and uh, that was why I had him to many books. Right. And I can say too, like as a reader of series, um, there's something kind of comforting when you do have that series and you can go back and you have, it's like reuniting with an old friend almost, especially if a year or so has gone by between releases, as, if you're reading them as they come out. Um, I know that I have some that it's almost like comfort food for me in that way, but it it is bittersweet when they do end because then you almost do feel like you're losing a friend. Yeah, it's it's tough. I got theory at the end of writing the last book, so it was, a, it was a little tough, but it had to be done. Right. So let's go ahead before we segue to audience questions. I have a couple questions just about your career as a whole, um, because you're so accomplished. You have published so many novels, um, and you did uh, provide credit to your teacher earlier in tonight's discussion, who really encouraged you to keep writing. But I was wondering, what was this, like, was there a pivotal moment where you're like, I'm going to become a writer and make this my full career? Like, this is becoming my identity. Well, it, I was in college, I was a slacker student. I always did the minimum to get by. Uh, and I was, uh, that was in my, I guess it was like my junior year uh, that I wrote stories for the college magazine and uh, unbeknownst to me, a professor submitted one to that Atlantic monthly college writing competition. And I was in small uh, state college in Pennsylvania and English teachers have been submitting uh, stories to that contest for decades and they'd never had any uh, prize winners in college. And suddenly I won a one of the prizes in the contest. And it made me Teflon. I, I had been a C student and suddenly I was an A student. And in my senior year, I could do no wrong. 
uh, I was still the same kind of messed up kid, but because I had won that prize from the Atlantic in the competition, every teacher thought I was this godsend. And I said, this is interesting. Uh, I'm still the goofball I was, but uh, they think I'm a genius. Uh, and that was the first thing that I thought, wow, this writing thing can give you certain notoriety, can give you a reputation that's different from what you've always had. And then I, there was no money prize. It was a certificate and, and uh, uh, to be framed and kept on your wall. And uh, so I sent the story to a magazine and they bought it and it was just $50. But in those days, 50 was like 500 now. And paperback books cost 50 cents. So suddenly I could buy a lot of paperbacks. And that was where I began to think, is there a, a life's work in this? And I had always been a heavy reader, but I never imagined I could also be a writer. And then after my senior year, uh, I got married to Julia, and I started writing. And the number of the stories sold. And it became a very sort of exciting existence. Uh, there was a lot of rejection, and you had to learn how to cope with that. Uh, but because I've been sort of uh, in the uh, dysfunctional family and uh, sort of an outcast uh, in school, I was used to rejection, so it didn't bother me. And uh, uh, then there came a day when I had sold a few paperback novels. They weren't very good, but I'd sold them. I wasn't making enough to live on. And my wife said, I know what you want to do. You want to write, you don't want to teach school because that's what I was doing. And she said, I'll support you for five years. And if you can't make it in five years, you'll never make it. Uh, and uh, I grabbed the opportunity. I became a, a, a word bum. Uh, everyone in the family, hers and mine, thought I was a bum. Um, she would spend her life supporting me. Uh, but it was the two of us pulling together. And uh, it took the five years. And even at the end of the five years, though I was making a living, I won't say I was writing anything of great quality, but it was a time in publishing when you could make a lot of mistakes and still be given a chance again. These days, they track you on computer. And if you're not successful in a short order, they don't want you anymore. But in that day, you could have failure after failure and they give you another chance because they wouldn't realize that the other publisher would be up with you. And it was, uh, it was a great time to grow up as a writer and to find my way. And, uh, and that's sort of how it happened. It, I fumbled into it. Right. And with your career now spanning multiple decades, what is for you personally, the most satisfying aspect of being an author? Is it being having the opportunity to have an idea in your head and create a finished product? Is it the idea that millions of people are reading your books? Um, or is it something more personal to you? It, 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 a lot of people think this isn't the case, but it is the case. Otherwise, I wouldn't have spent all those years where I was just hanging on by a thread still doing it. The thing I love about it, writing is writing. It's that challenge that you have when you sit down at the keyboard. And it's the exhilaration you get when things are working, when a character comes alive, when the story starts to go somewhere you never anticipated, and you recognize it as the right place to go. Uh, I am the only best-selling writer I know that never did a national book tour. I've always refused. I have minimized my publicity footprint. I've done enough to satisfy publishers and never as much as they want uh, because that would take too much time away from the keyboard. What I've loved about this life and what I still love about it is I get to do something turn a living that is play as well as hard work. And most people, are engaging in hard work that they don't find very much play in. So I recognize what a blessing that is. And uh, it's why I'm still doing it at my age. I, I keep being asked, when are you going to retire? And I'm saying, when I fall dating with a 
keyboard. Uh, and uh, hopefully that's no time soon. Uh, so it's just the, the, the opportunity to have been able to do it and to live my life you know, in a creative endeavor that is, is the best thing about it. Yeah. I would still be doing it uh, uh, just as I did for about 15 years with little financial reward. If it still had been no financial reward to speak of, I'd still be doing it. And fortunately, it turned out the other way. Absolutely. And I think something special about your books is I, you know, the big authors, the other ones that share the accolades with you in terms of how many books have been sold, how many number one New York Times bestsellers, you can very easily pinpoint be like, that's a straight thriller. This is a straight mystery. This is straight romance. Um, but with you, I kind of almost label you as like your own genre, if that makes sense, where you really incorporate elements of horror, thriller, dystopian, science fiction, fantasy elements, um, all together into this one concoction that really, I think, makes you stand separate from other contemporaries or when people try to lump you as, oh, you're just horror or you're just thriller. No, it's not quite the right thing. Um, how do you kind of juggle all of these different um, genres to make your own um, kind of like your own sound, not your sound, but, you know, your own vibe, essentially, to your books? It's, uh, believe me, uh, there's not always been support for that among publishers. They they do want you to keep writing the same book uh, because it worked before and they'll do it with some slight redressing. And I can't do it. I, I, I probably, when I was younger, was mercenary enough to do it if I could have done it. But uh, it just didn't work out that way. And I think it's partly because I've always been a reader in just every genre. Uh, and I consider literary fiction another genre. It's mm -hmm. it's it's nothing necessarily more uh, special because every genre has produced great work. Uh, and uh, so I, don't, I was always motivated to, uh, I want to put this into the story. I want to do this with it. I want to do that. And in the early days, writing across genre novel, uh, publishers hadn't seen it and they didn't like it. Um, I was all, I, my agents, early agents, were always pushing me to stop this. Uh, you can't have a career doing this. People will buy a book thinking it's the thing they love. And it's partly that, but it's other things they don't love. And my attitude was, well, then I'll make them love those other things. Uh, every genre has great strengths and pulling them together in, in one book actually seems to me to make the book more flavorful, more interesting and, and more like life actually. Uh, and uh, so I just kept at it and thank God it worked because I, I think uh, I probably couldn't have kept going as a writer if I was asked to write uh, the same book over and over. Well, I was asked, but I simply couldn't do. Absolutely. And I think that um, it can kind of also serve as kind of a gateway too, in some ways, where as like, for example, I'm not um, the biggest like straight science fiction reader, uh, books that are heavy in sci-fi. Library, library closing book. announcement. My apologies, we can't uh, turn that off. Um, so what I was saying though is I don't read a lot of um, standard classic science fiction, it's more hard boiled, um, but having those elements in a story that also incorporates elements of you know thrillers, so fast paced chapters, lots of action going on, it can make it much more accessible um, to readers. And it can also pique their interest by having a little bit of taste of that to continue branching out to, to reading in those different genres, I think. Uh, that's that's certainly the way I feel, and it's uh, and I think been proven. Otherwise, I, I my career would have been over long ago. Uh, so, but it's uh, it, it's my current publisher has never argued with me about that. That's actually the first uh, not to have argued with me about that, uh, which is a blessing because others will say, "Man, you can't have this in it, or you can't have that." And one of the big things is when I started putting humor. In, to balance the darkness, I was told you can't do that because uh, people who want to be scared or want to read suspense or want to be in edge of their seat, they won't relate well to the 
humor. They won't want that. It'll distract them. And my attitude was, if you laugh with the character, if the character has a sense of humor, uh, then uh, you care more about them. And as a consequence, you worry more about what's about to occur in their uh, in their story. And I think that's been proven to be true too. Although humor is a very delicate thing. Uh, you can go over the top in the wrong way. So it's a, it's a challenge, but, uh, but I sort of won that battle. Nobody argues with me. Absolutely. So we'll go ahead and pivot now. Um, we have a little bit of time left for audience questions. So please feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and mm, that one was kind of already answered a little bit. I'm gonna go ahead and pivot to this one that they want to let you know that they love the Brother Odd series as well as Christopher Snow. Um, and you kind of mentioned, obviously, with Odd Thomas, the inspiration for writing. But would you like to talk a little bit about Christopher Snow and that inspiration? Well, yes, we lived uh, at the time I was writing that we live uh, in Newport Beach, California, which is, uh, has some of the most famous surfing spots in the world. And uh, we actually had a house on the harbor and uh, you were just everywhere you looked was surfing, the surfing world. And it became very interesting. I mean, the surfing culture, it's not just a, a sport, it's, it's an entire culture. And I started being interested in the culture and picking up this, that, the other thing. And at some point, uh, I, it's strange moments crossing your mind and strange things happen. I was thinking, I want to write about this. I want to get into the surfing world and really write uh, about it in a way that's authentic with characters who uh, whose lives are built around surfing and the surfing culture. Uh, but I didn't initially have, couldn't think of an entree to it. I was talking about background, but I didn't have the character. And then at one point I read this article about this uh, illness, zero derma pigmentosum, about people who lose the ability to process light through their skin. And if they get uh, sunlight, lamplight, too much lamplight, too much of almost any light, uh, can end up killing them through multiple cancers. And I was fascinated with that. And somewhere in the course of that, I can no longer remember the exact moment, I sort of sat up and said, what about a surfer who is passionate about the surfing life, whose friends are all surfers, but he has zero thermal pigmentosum. He has to surf at night and his life is so radically constricted. And as soon as that thought came to me, I knew I had something special. And then it was building the little world of this town, uh, Moonlight Bay. Uh, in which Chris Snow lives and his friend Bobby and all of the people in their circle. And then it sort of all built itself. And one of my great regrets was my publisher not understanding the book two that well and the delay that led to never writing book three, because those are two of my favorite books. And uh, I think uh, that they may come when I get those books back and them. I'm still copious menace enough to write number three. Uh, so you never give up though. Absolutely. Um, we have someone in the audience who would just like to let you know that her favorite character in literature by far would be Odd Thomas and that they always wish that they had had him as a friend. And we talked a little bit about the horrific evil and depravity, as well as the innocence and spirituality of your characters and how they have you have such a, a dichotomy and a range of different characters in your book. I'm just curious, um, we can expand upon that a little bit about, you know, where are these characters? Is it like a character comes in your mind and from that point you're like, I have to write this book right now? Or do you kind of have a backlog of different characters that you're mulling in the back of your mind right now and kind of letting them? marinate a little bit as you're thinking of different potential stories in the future? No, it generally is the story idea comes to me. You often, as soon as I finish the book, I'm on, uh, 
I may have the other, uh, I have a drawer that I throw ideas into and they come to me. I never write anything that's in the drawer. I always think when I run dry, I'll go to that drawer. What happens instead is I finish the novel and within a few days, a week, uh, an idea occurs to me that I get really uh, excited about. Aunt Thomas was one of the few that ever uh, came to me in the midst of another book because I concentrate so intently on the book I'm writing that I, I sort of block out in a distracting idea. Uh, but uh, at the end of the book, I'm vulnerable to some new idea. I've talked about this before. Uh, I was, uh, I had finished a book. I was in a studio meeting in LA and I came out of it in a bad mood. You always do it when you come out of studio meetings. And I was in my wife's SUV, and it was in the days when the CD deck held six CDs. And uh, she had it filled with uh, Paul Simon and Simon and Garfunkel. And I'm a big fan of Paul Simon and of Simon and Garfunkel. I think Paul Simon's arguably the greatest songwriter of our lives. And uh, so I put on some Simon, and there was a song that, Patterns and it had a line in it. My life is made of patterns that can scarcely be controlled. And within 15 miles, I, I had the idea for life expectancy that came out of that line in the song. And then the characters started coming to you. And you, you, it's a very difficult thing to explain because the, you think, okay, who do I, I know this guy is going to, on the night he's born, have predictions made about his life that start coming through. And the more serious predictions are when he's 20 uh, and his life becomes in jeopardy. And since all the ones that were related to his birth were true, he knows these are going to come true as well. Now, who is he? Uh, I have a tendency to like my characters. Sometimes I go with the character by Jane Block, who was a former FBI agent. But I sort of like people who are everyday people who have not everyday challenges to face. And for some reason, I get the character Jimmy Talk, who was a baker, and his father was a baker, and, and that's his world. And then suddenly, because of this thing that happens the night of his birth, he's thrown into this horrendous series of events starting when he's 20 years old. Uh, so the characters come to you as the story matures. At least that's how it works for me. And I didn't know who the villains were until I was writing the opening sequence. And it turned out one of the villains was going to be a clown, which, believe me, was something I tried to avoid when the idea came to me. I said, it can't possibly be a clown. And then I thought, well, it could be not a big red shoe, all the snows gone. It could be an Emmy Kelly kind of clown in a ragged suit. And then he came together in my mind. And when the novel started working, I realized, good heavens, this novel wouldn't work if he's anything but a clown. Uh, and that makes you wonder where all this stuff actually comes from. How much of it is out of your own head? And how much of it is coming to you about something in the ether? And uh, I don't want to get too mystical, but there is certainly a mystical element to it. Absolutely. Uh, let's see, we have a couple questions left. We'll try and get through as many as we can. Michael would like to let you know, just as simple, as a longtime fan of your works, I want to say thank you for all of your many great works, which I agree, many great works. Um, you know, I do have a side question. You mentioned earlier that when you make, you make mistakes, you'll get angry letters from fans. But do you appreciate receiving um, positive letters from your fans? I receive, I, I accept positive and negative, uh, it, uh, it doesn't matter to me. It's, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's, it's very sweet. That I, I used to do book signings that I don't do for security reasons, got pretty heavy at one point. And, uh, but uh, we would do signings of two or 3,000 people would show up and it was sort of amazing. Nobody would come up and spit on your shoes and say, I hate what you do. They would come up and tell you how much they loved it or how one book had such a profound effect on them. You can't not love that. It's uh, 
I was a kid who grew up in awful circumstances and it was books that saved me. It was writers who showed me my life wasn't the only life that people lived. When you're a kid, you don't know. You think every family is as dysfunctional as your own until you see examples otherwise. And so it was so important to me to how books changed my life. But when people say you give them hope or you, or you, you make them laugh or you entertain them, it's the greatest thing you could get. So I'm, I would never say get out of my face. <laughs> Oh, that's that's really nice to hear that you still appreciate the feedback from your fans. Um, I think that's really special. Um, I do have one last uh, question for you before we wrap tonight, because I know people have already, um, you know, this has been out now for two weeks. I'm sure plenty of people have already grabbed up their copy. If you haven't, though, you can grab your copy through the Learn It Out. We put the link in the chat for you. And now they're thinking, OK, I've got my Dean fix. When will the next Dean book come out? So I have to ask, what's next for you in your publishing catalog? Um, and can you give us any little sneak peek about what to look forward to? Uh, well, there's a book coming, uh, I think it's May of next year, called Going Home in the Dark. And it's a, a story of uh, some friends who were all outcasts in high school, three guys and a girl. And they were all geeks. And uh, uh, they sort of sheltered together in a little club and uh, it fended off the world. And now they're all 35 and one of them falls into a coma. Uh, and he's the only one that never left their little Midwest town. Uh, and the other ones have all succeeded surprisingly. One is a highly successful actress. One is a successful novelist. The other is uh, an artist uh, whose works sell very aggressively. And they all, want to go home because the one remaining friend is in a coma. And one of them says, you know, it's like when we were in high school and all those people were in comas. Most of them came out of it. And they look at each other and go, what? Who did we know that was in a coma? And they start understanding something happened in their uh, teenage years that they've been made to forget. And it's a comic novel, but it's also got some pretty dark stuff in it. And I had one of the best times ever uh, uh, writing it. So it comes out next May, and I kind of hope we'll, we'll relate to it. Uh, I, I agree to the fun. Having been a geek in high school, I knew exactly how to write about it. Well, I'm looking forward to reading that, as I'm sure everybody that's intending tonight is as well. Um, the hour went by really quickly. I just want to thank you so much, because as you mentioned, you really don't do a lot of interviews and uh, to book tours and things like that anymore. So thank you for considering the Hudson Library and our community um, for your um, for your time. It's much appreciated. And thank you so much for all the books you've written. And I'm sure that everyone in the audience is agreeing with me 100% about how much it means and how much we enjoy reading your stuff. Uh, you're very sweet. Thank you for making it all go and flow so easily. I actually had fun. So. And as you asked me before everyone joined us live, if my opinion of you was going to change after the hour, it has not. I still think you're an amazing writer. So thank you. Okay. Well, I hope that's true. I don't it think is. you're a liar. So. No, it didn't. So thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight for this virtual program. And remember his copy of his book is available for purchase. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Take care. Take care.